Do you have an aggressive child? Do you have a child that hits, that bites, that throws, that breaks things, that runs away, that puts holes in the wall, that breaks your phone? If you have an aggressive child, this podcast episode is for you. I did therapeutic foster care for 10 years, and I raised children in therapeutic care who were very aggressive, highly aggressive. And as well, I'm going to invite my friend and colleague. Her name is Gabriel. He's the indomitable black man. He's a fellow parenting coach, exceptional student, educator, and behavioral technician. And he has a lot of experience working with children who are highly aggressive. And we are going to come together to talk to you about how to successfully parent a highly aggressive child without joining them in their aggression. Being secure parents. Okay, so let's go with this interview and I'll see you at the end. Hello, Gabriel. Thank you for coming Hi. to the Parenting with Understanding podcast. Thank you for having me. I've been meaning to have you on my podcast for a long time because I've been following you for a long, 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 long OG time. Yeah, very, it's been a long time. I'm very curious. What do you do for a living? I know that you work with special need kids, with highly aggressive kids. And I just want to say that your social need is so inspiring and at the same time educational for people who think because they don't have a gentle kid, they cannot raise their kids with respect. And you are one of them, one of the voices that we need in this world saying like, hey, those kids need even more respect. They need even more consideration, more mercy and empathy than any other one. So what, what do you do for a living? Like, how do you come up with the indomitable black man? So what I do for a living, I started off working as a teacher at a private school. I left teaching temporarily and I went into um, becoming a registered behavioral technician. So I work in the field of applied behavioral analysis, mm -hmm. working with children who were on the spectrum or who had any type of exceptionality and helping them understand life skills and learning um, behavior management. So specifically children who were extremely aggressive. I specialized in working with them. Anytime there was a new case of a child that had extreme behaviors, I got first pick. And so I worked with a lot of very extremely aggressive kids. After that, well, I guess concurrently with that, I was also in school for exceptional student education. So uh, ESC here in Florida, special education and other places. So I work with kids who have any type of neurodivergency, whether it's something that's just behavioral or um, a mental disability or just a learning disability, I work with the entire gamut. If you are not a gen ed student, I work with you. Mm. Okay. So in terms of you said that you help them with life skills and behavior intervention, and I'm an autistic person. <laughs> so what I was once one of those kids that you work with. I just want to know, how, can, how could my life be a lot easier growing up if the teachers in my life and the par my parents knew and understood my needs? Because I used to be that aggressive kid when I felt overwhelmed, when I felt, um, when I had sensory, a sensory meltdown or when I was encountering new places or new people. So from your experience, what they could have done differently to, for me to have a different experience. One of the things that I do before I ever start working with any child is I have to develop a relationship with them. And while I'm developing that relationship, I'm learning how they understand the world and how they communicate, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, whether it's through their behavior or through what they say, I'm always looking at what they're trying to express and if i can understand how you perceive the world i can figure everything else out so mm. i would say the most important thing is trying to get into a child's world they're always inviting you in it you just have to know how to get into it 
once you're there and you understand the way they see the world and you're playing the game with them, you're able to manipulate the rules of the game to where mm. you're both now overlapping and creating a new world. So mm. had I been your teacher, I would have first tried to figure out who are you specifically? How do you see the world? What's causing you to do X, Y, and Z? If you were overstimulated, I would have had to notice that. I would have picked up on it and I would have had things that you could have done that would have fit into your world that would have made you have a better sense of this world or giving you the tools to better understand it. Hmm. Yeah. Having that relationship with them that, that really resonates with me because I did therapeutic foster care for 10 years. So I did work with those children as well. And I think that was the biggest tool that I used, just building my relationship with them. When they feel that you care about them, they end up caring about the things that you say, but if they sense that you don't care or you're just very stuck on what it needs to be done, then they're not going to easily follow. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. And how you see the world. As you were talking, I was thinking like, if they knew saw the world a lot more enhanced, a lot different than the other kids. While the other kids were just hot because it's hot, I was I was burning. <laughs> My skin felt like I was burning, like I was it felt everything felt a lot more for me. So I, I did wish those adults knew how it felt to be in my skin, even if they didn't have the same experience, but at least try to understand it. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so I want to tackle a few misconceptions that people have in terms of aggress aggression in children and how we should parent them. Because most of my audience here, their parents, they're not educators. Some are, some are. Many of them have neurodivergent kids. This is the thing. I've, I've heard this a lot. Gentle parenting, respectful parenting is for gentle, respectful kids. What's your take on that? I'm sorry, you broke up just a little bit. Say that last part again. Gentle parenting or respectful parenting is for gentle kids. Mm -hmm. I've heard that a lot. What's your take on that? I don't even get how that makes sense because <laughs> there's no such thing as a gentle kid per se. Kids are kids. They're, they're kids. They respond to the stimuli in their environment and they're going to respond to it in different ways based on how they see other norms around. So for instance, if I grew up in a very chaotic household where everybody's yelling at each other, fighting each other, there's a good chance that this child is going to also yell and be chaotic. If I grow up in a house where there's respect and there's understanding and we're working to talking out situations, there's a good chance that the child's going to do the same thing. So gentle parenting is not for gentle kids. Gentle parenting makes gentle kids. And the gentle doesn't mean that they're weak. It doesn't mean that they're going to get taken advantage of. It doesn't mean that they are going to be bullied. It means that these are kids who know how to navigate through life. They know how to establish boundaries. They understand how to respect people. They understand how to respect boundaries, set expectations. They're very well-adjusted human individuals. And that's the complete antithesis of what I think society is trying to paint a picture of them as. Mm -hmm. You know, what? I think what throws people off is the title, gentle parenting. Mm -hmm. But in reality, what we're doing is secure parenting. And we are raising secure kids, you know? Um, and when, when you say, hey, if the children mirror what they see at home, they do. They do mirror what they see at home. And at the same time, I hear parents saying, hey, but I'm gentle, I'm kind, and they take advantage of my kindness. And then because they do the opposite. And what I see is that they correlate their kind moments and their gentle moments with I'm a gentle parent, but in reality, they are bouncing back and forth between conscious parenting or respectful parenting and authoritarian parenting. So the kids are kind of confused, <laughs> waiting for the, for the parent to explode and really not 
feel insecure, but more hypervigilant. I don't know. That's, that's why I've seen when people say, hey, gentle parenting doesn't work is because they don't work it. They go, they bounce back and forth between being considerate and kind with their kids when they feel okay, but when they are trigger themselves and when they're impa impatient, 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 I don't know, impatient. impatient, then they go right to yelling. What have you seen, because you're a parenting coach as well, what have you seen in terms of the patterns of the parents that, that come to your practice? So it's, oh God, it's always them trying to do gentle parenting and then they wind up falling into permissive or they wind up falling into authoritarian. They go back to what they know. And a lot of times it's due to just inconsistency and their inconsistency is what's consistent in the child's life. So the child is over here and then over here and then over here because there's no boundary set up. And I see that all the time. It'll be, well, I told little Billy five and six times to do something. He still hasn't done it yet. Okay. Well, what consequences did you have in place right. prior to so that it doesn't continue happening? Because at that point, right. now you're getting pretty permissive or little Billy doesn't do anything until I yell at him. Have Leo you Billy's thought? waiting. Leo Billy's waiting for the parents. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. Because that's where the boundary is. He can keep pushing until he hits that boundary. Mm -hmm. Why don't you set the boundary sooner? Hey, do this now. Practice doing it now. Reinforce when he does it now. That way he knows where the boundary is. He's not going to push past it. And he has an incentive not to push past it. It's mm -hmm. about being consistent and seeing things differently, which I think a lot of people have a problem with. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that even permissiveness could sound in the form of yelling, because if you're saying the same thing, but a little bit louder and still not getting results, that's permissive. Mm -hmm. um, that reminded me of a video I got tagged on, on TikTok. I'm sure you've seen it too. Amelia. I don't know if you've seen the little video of the Leo Amelia that she her screen time was over and she was just throwing things. She was like, a, I would say 10 year old. And she, she started throwing the mom's personal items, like her, her hand soap or, you know, small things like that. And then she kept escalating to bigger things like the mom's phone. But all the mom was doing was like, Amelia, stop. Amelia, don't do that. Amelia, I, you're not going to throw my phone. I dare you to throw my phone. And it was just that. And then I was just thinking, just telling a child to not do something is not setting a boundary because a boundary always comes with an action. What's going to happen? If this happens, what's going to happen? You know? Absolutely. So I was discussing it with my husband and, and then he asked me, what, what would you do? I said, okay, I think there would have, like, for sure, this could have been prevented. Possibly Amelia didn't have a proper setup of what she, the expectation was when it comes to screen time. For example, my kids, they know that they get screens when they wake up in the morning. Once they breakfast, no more screen time until after dinner. And that's set up. It's established in my family. Possibly that was not in place. And the second thing, just telling her don't, don't throw things is not going to get her to stop. You know, I would probably, if she were at that point, I'll probably say, Hey, that's not going to get you what you want. Let's work towards you being able to get what you want, which is more screen time. If you're throwing my phone, that's, that, that's tell, you're telling me you're not safe to have your your ipad back because mm -hmm. i don't know if you're gonna throw it you know so what what would you do in that case i think it could have been preventable and i think more and more assertive tone of what could happen if you do throw things um if you're throwing things right now, you're telling me you're not ready for screen time later because I don't know if you're, we need right. to have a conversation. We need to work on, on boundaries. We need to, and I need to make sure you're safe with things. Exactly. I, I have a, a same approach, but when I'm in the midst of it and I've been in, oh God, I have been in the midst of it with so many different kids, my not God, I let them do it. And what I mean is when I was working at this center, I worked at an ABA center and the kids would melt down for anything all the time. It was not a day that would go by where you would not have two or three kids melting down. It was 
something to see. And I had one specific kid who would take off his clothes. He would wet himself. He would throw toys, all this stuff here. I'm not going to sit here and try to stop you. Mm -hmm. Unless it's something dangerous, I would just mm -hmm. go ahead and let you do it. And then when you're done and you've calmed all the way down, let's pick it up. Let's pick let's everything up. put it back up. where it was. <laughs> Eventually, you know, something that you reminded of reminded me of my one of my children in therapeutic care. He had a lot of aggression because a lot of things going on in his life and his health. But I remember he sure his room was the safest place in the in the entire house. It, it has no frames. It has nothing that he could break or hurt himself. And every time he got into that aggressive mood, I would just go to his room because he always followed me everywhere I went. He wasn't going to be breaking stuff in the kitchen if I'm not there. He's going to break things where I mm -hmm. am. So I always went to his room like, okay, you want to throw your mattress to the floor? Okay, do it. You're safe. I think that's also really important that what you said there, he followed you where you were going and he would destroy yeah. stuff there. That's really a lot of times a cry for somebody to help me regulate the dysregulation I have. That's, that's that understanding of how they think and how their world is. Sometimes even in that aggressive behavior, they're calling out for some sort of help to help regulate the storm yeah. that's in their mind. And that's, God, that's one of the best things when you can, when you can get that level of understanding and help them out of that. And it's not that it's never going to happen again. It's not that you're not going to fail, but it is that they feel safe around you in order to have that response. But let's talk about the parent piece because that's where the rabbit meets the road. If we say, hey, so I'm just going to let him throw the, the mattress on the floor and, and all, throw all his clothes out the window, then that means I'm permissive. Then I'm, I'm, that means I don't have control. Like there is a lot of mindset, parental mindset that gets in the way of things getting easier or of de-escalating things instead of escalating things because they are in, parents are in the mindset of, I need to get a hold of them. Then they tend to escalate things with the things they do. Um, yeah, then... I don't know why I was saying all that, but. <laughs> no, no, that's, I mean, if we're looking at parents, I have a 16 year old and my 16 year old, I came home one night and he had messed up my house and it was a very organized, chaotic mess. And I could, I'm very hyper vigilant. So I could see what he did, where he went, how everything played out. I could piece together what he was doing. He was throwing my dog bones from my dog down the hallway. He chipped a piece of my wall. He put all of the all of the items that were on in the pantry on one shelf. It was very strange. And he was just sitting there and I look and I could have gone one or two ways about it. I could have been very upset. I could have yelled at him. I could have, you know, told him off all of that jazz. Could have done that. Then I could have just figured out why he did it in the first place to try to understand the root and then change it. And I took the latter approach because why would I? Clearly something has happened. Something is wrong. I did not know how to prevent it because I had not seen this behavior from him before. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let me figure out why this happened in the first place and let's work on changing it. So I just asked him, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And then here come the waterworks. No, he Aww. wasn't okay. I found out why. He felt lonely. Okay, Aww. I understand. Here's what we can do going forward in the future. But if you mess my house up again, I'm going to eat you. I did eat him, <laughs> but... He also didn't mess my house up, so I guess he's good. But that's generally, it really has to be, we got to understand the root behavior of why something happens. Once we understand the root, can we fix it from there? Usually mm -hmm. we can. Mm -hmm. I want to point something out that you said. He's 16. A lot of parents of teens come to, to me and say they know better. And we've, we've, re we've visited this topic way too many times. Uh, and it's like, again, their expectation and mindset of what they, their children should do or should not do, should be able to do or should not be able to do because they're old enough. So the, he's old enough or she's old enough expectation and mindset has robbed a lot of parents from truly seeing their teens. Because the matter of fact is that they're still kids and their brain is not developed. 
And even though they could communicate calmly when they're calm, it's a fact that when they are upset, they have less of a chance of being able to communicate inassertively because their brain is not developed. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what you did there. You ditched the expectation of he's old enough, he's 16, and instead you truly try to see what, what was going on. Absolutely. That was, and that was uh, admirable. <laughs> thank you. But even more yeah. to the point, I'm not going to, I can sit here and expect somebody to do something all day and half the night. I don't know where their mind is at 24 seven and the brain is something that has to be developed. The prefrontal cortex has to be developed. How many situations has he been in where he's had to critically think about something that has mm -hmm. to be developed and I have to put kids in that mindset to develop it in the first place. It's like a muscle. I can't, I can't expect you to lift 400 pounds and you can't even lift five. Mm. I have to put you in situations where you continually lift to the point where you're now developed enough to lift this 400 pounds. Yeah. You're so right. I, I rem remember my 16 year old at the time. Now he's an adult. One day he came from school. He, I think I've told this story way too many times here on the podcast, <laughs> but it's relevant. He came to school. From school, he slammed the door. He didn't say hi. He threw everything on the floor when he's supposed to hang it. Um, he passed the baby gate. He, he slammed it so hard that it fell to the floor. My twins cried. They were 10 months old at the time. He went to his room. He slammed the door and stayed there for the whole afternoon. When it was about dinner time, he came out. And then he came out, he saw me, he kind of like, he was not expecting that I was running into him because that was the time that I, I, I bathed my twins, but he ran into me and he did this. I said, are you hungry? <laughs> he said, yes. I'm like, okay, let's go eat. I let him eat. Like, why would I even talk about problems with him when he's so hungry? He didn't even eat after school. Right after dinner, I said, what, what happened? That's not you. You always come from school. And this is one thing that I teach my, my clients. Look for changes in patterns. This is different. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't usually come and that, does all this. And then he said, the kids at school were calling me the F word, you know, because he's a gay. So they were calling him the, the F word. I'm like, okay, I, now I understand why you did all that. I get it. We went to the school the next day and I mean, we handled it. But then that night, the next day, not even that day, the next day we talked about, okay, next time that you, that happens to you or you're very upset about something that happens at school, talk to me and I will help you. And that was the last time that he slammed doors in my house. And he was in my house until he turned 18. So, yeah, like the, your story of your 16-year-old reminded me of this story. I with, love that. I love how son. you specifically handled that situation because you didn't overreact. I know a certain household, if I would have ever slammed the door in my house, oh, my mom would have kicked that door in so fast. Boy, what the heck is wrong with you? It would have been, it would have been hell to fame, but I love how you kept the palm head. You just let him. I love that. Yeah. And then we said, and then I said, the twins cried when the baby gate came down. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. And he started crying. I'm like, maybe you can make up to him, to them in some way. And then he played with, he never played with them, but he, that day he played with them for a little bit. And that was his way of making up with the twins. <laughs> yeah. It was, I think it was a beautiful moment. We could have more beautiful moments with our teens if we lift up all the, I would say it's pride. I think it might be parental pride of like, you, either you come to my house and not say hi to me and do all those things, slam my doors. If we just get rid of that and, and think about them instead of us, things could go way better. Oh, yeah. So we talked about aggression. I think I, I want to wrap up with takeaways. I would say my biggest takeaway that I learned from you today is to see children, <laughs> to stop for a moment and see children, see what they're going through, because we can always find a way out, even through their aggression, when we are seeing them. What about yeah. you? 
I think my biggest takeaway uh, was specifically with the last story that you gave. And for me, that was compassion. You had compassion for somebody who was going through a tough time. You didn't judge. You did not anything like that. You wanted to find out what was going on and you helped. And I think that's something that we all could do better on. Just having compassion for another person who's going through something. Where can people find you? Everybody can find me on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube under the indomitable black man. If you type it into Google, you'll find me. Yes. Yeah. Follow him. And remember, follow High Input Club everywhere. TikTok, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and subscribe to the Parenting with Understanding podcast. Thank you so much, Gabe, for this time with us. And I hope there is a uh, next time. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for being with us for this interview. And I have a question for you. Would you like to break free from angry reactions towards your children? Bring peace to your parenting so you can raise emotionally healthy children. You don't have to end your children's childhood in frustration and overwhelm and yelling. You can break your cycle this year. I have an invitation for you. I created a free class where I walk you through the system that has taken 14,151 parents from frustration, overwhelm, and high, high reactivity towards their kids to having a lot more peace and raising emotionally healthy children. It has allowed them to have easier mornings, easier nights, easier after school routine, and just enjoying their time with their kids. If you want to sign up for this free class, all you have to do is go to hicparenting.com or you go to the description of this podcast episode and then the link is there and you can access this class right now. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, give me a thumbs up if you're watching it from YouTube and would you leave me a positive review? Just open the description again and let me know how this podcast episode or the Parenting with Understanding podcast has helped you in your parenting journey. And remember to follow us at High Impact Club on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube, everywhere. And it only takes understanding of yourself and of your children's needs to transform your parenting. This is your host, Marcella Collier, and I'll see you next time.